Good afternoon and welcome to the second lecture in our Fall 2023 Dean's Leaders and Lanyap Lecture Series. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement about the land we inhabit. The city of New Orleans was not built upon virgin ground, but merely serves as a continuation of a great indigenous trade hub known in Choctaw as Balbacha, the land of other tongues. For thousands of years, people have lived along the Mississippi River and Balbacha served as a place for diverse cultures to come together. We acknowledge the grounds of our campus and the city around us as home to numerous tribes before and after the arrival of Europeans. With gratitude and honor, Tulane University pays tribute to the original inhabitants of this land. The oranges of this lecture series come from a school-wide desire to give our students the opportunity to meet and learn from some of the most distinguished leaders in public health. We aim to give our students the tools and experiences needed to become the next wave of innovative leaders in creating the chances to learn uh, from and engage leaders from around the nation is a priority of, of mine. This lecture series also boasts something distinctly New Orleanian, lanyap. Lanyap is a word you'll hear throughout South Louisiana. It's the idea of adding a little something extra on an unexpected gift and perfectly captures the art of hospitality we show our guests. We have adopted the concept of lanyap by incorporating the arts into the public health lecture series. Each month accompanying these lectures, we will be activating the DeBall Gallery, just right outside, to host exhibits combining the arts and public health providing alternative expressions to the common public health topics. We hope after this lecture, you'll take the time to discover the exhibit in the DeBall Gallery titled The Art of Birthing and meet the curators who are here with us today. Arts and public health are inextricably linked and we're excited this month to have the artistic dialogue about maternal and infant health and solutions to move towards health equity. And now let me introduce today's speakers. <clears throat> Dr. Tracy Collins is Dean and Professor at the University of New Mexico College of Population Health. During her tenure, she served as the New Mexico Secretary of Health to effectively respond to the COVID-19 emergency in her state. Dr. Collins has served in a variety of academic leadership roles, in addition to maintaining a clinical practice as a vascular specialist. Welcome Dean Collins. We also have with us Dr. Paul Irwin, Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Dr. Irwin gained his medical degree from UAB School of Medicine, his MPH from Johns Hopkins, and a doctorate in public health from the University of North Carolina. Thank you both for being here today. And I'll invite Dr. Collins up first to give a few remarks about leadership in public health. So thank you, Dean Leviste and his wonderful team. And it's been great um, having a chance to visit last night and again this morning. So I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing my career, my pathway, and how I have landed now as the Dean of the College of Population Health. And I'll also give you a definition of what population health is. So really the objectives today for me for just about 15 minutes is to talk about my career to date and then helping you think through if you're addressing or seeking opportunities for your career, the things that I considered as I move through my career. So first off, I started um, out in San Leandro, California. That's where I was born. So I lived in California for the first 13 years of my life. And then my dad moved us to Oklahoma. So there's a big culture shift there from California to Oklahoma, where we went from, you know, diversity and uh, beautiful scenery to red dirt, cowboy boots and trucks. But I did survive that. And I wanted to just share with you a bit about my family. Um, to your left, those are my siblings. My mom and dad are in the center there. Let's see if the pointer, is this a pointer here? I'll just shoot the mouse. In the center are my parents, and then the outer are my sisters, and that's me with my other sister. So there are four girls. I'm the youngest of four. 
in the center is my COVID dog combo, <laughs> a multi-poo. So I acquired him right as we were looking at six months into the pandemic. And I wanted something in the house that was not worried about COVID. So I got combo. <laughs> um, and then that's my partner, Rob. He owns a farm in Kansas. We met in Kansas. And so he moved with me to New Mexico. And now we're enjoying Albuquerque, New Mexico. So my first leadership role after completing um, residency in internal medicine in Tulsa, Oklahoma, moving to Boston to complete my um, MPH or general medicine fellowship at Harvard, and then moving down to Houston, I was fortunate to re be recruited up to Minnesota to work with a colleague, and you may know him, uh, Dean Levis, uh, Jazz Alawalia. He actually had been very successful in acquiring NIH funding and during my time in Houston, I was able to get VA funding, RWJ funding, but not NIH funding. And so I went to work with him in Minnesota. And that's when I got my first R01, looking at promoting walking in African-Americans with peripheral artery disease or what we call poor leg circulation. While I was in Minneapolis, across my screen came the opportunity to serve as a chair of a department of preventive medicine and public health but it was in Wichita, Kansas. Now, like when I moved to Oklahoma and I was like, where are we? I'd only seen signs for Wichita, so I'd never traveled there. So I actually went down to Wichita three times before I decided I'll take this position as chair because typically for an internist and now vascular specialist, you usually have to become a division director, then a department chair, and then maybe a dean. And I thought this would be a fast track to becoming a chair of a department so it'd be chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine and Public Health in a medical school there at University of Kansas on the Wichita side. So there are three major campuses, now four. There's Kansas City for KU, there's Wichita, there's Lawrence, there's Salina. And so this is one of those regional campuses with a two year uh, program. And so when I came in the door, we became a four year program and I was recruited to Wichita to grow research because for years they were told we only train the future workforce. We don't want research here. But they had a new dean and he recruited me there to serve as chair of this department and to grow research. And it may not seem like a large number, but while I was there, we secured three K awards. And Kansas City said, you'll, you'll never get a K award. And we got three. And we got more NIH funding. I convened some workshops to get faculty used to writing grants, to get them up to speed on competing and submitting to the NIH because they had largely been relying on um, the Kansas Health Foundation and buddies they'd had around for years for their funding. So we did achieve a lot during my time there at University of Kansas in uh, Wichita. While I was there in Wichita, I completed ELAM, Executive Leadership in Academic Medicine. I got a second master's in healthcare delivery science, and that really got me energized around the social determinants of health, or what we call those upstream factors. You know, largely in medicine, we're looking downstream. And so I really, I was nominated to serve as a dean of one of the second such colleges of its kind in the country, the College of Population Health. And when you think of population health, think of public health and healthcare delivery working closely together. And so I was nominated, I visited Albuquerque a couple of times, I was offered the position and then I moved there in 2019. So my tenure as Dean of the College of Population Health started in July of 2019. Now, um, New Mexico, much like Kansas is a very rural state. Kansas had 105, has 105 counties. Uh, New Mexico has 33 counties. Kansas has a health department largely in each county. New Mexico has one health department. It's a centralized system. We do have health councils working throughout various counties, but we have one health department. So while there at University of New Mexico, starting in July of 2019, I had about nine core faculty and like three adjuncts or part-time and so we were really a very small college. And so quite naturally, I was recruited to grow the college, recruit more faculty, increase the student body, and do all these wonderful, exciting things. And then we all know what happened. COVID hit. 
So like many of you, we had to take additional roles. And so for me, an additional role that I had to take on was overseeing the health protocols committee for the president of the University of New Mexico. And in that role, we had to create actually in two days, a 50 page document outlining how we were gonna keep students safe, staff safe, faculty safe. When could we bring people back to the campus? Uh, how could we have students in the dorms? All of these issues around health. Because I was leading that health protocols, I was also attending a weekly meeting with state leaders. Um, one of the leaders was over the human services department, Dr. David Scrace. It was called a modeling meeting every Tuesday. And I'm sure you had these as well, where you were predicting cases, hospitalizations and deaths for the next two weeks. And so because I got to know him, unfortunately for the state, the secretary of health at the time abruptly resigned. She was describing eating jelly beans for dinner and having to work 16 hour days as secretary of health. And I remember saying, oh, that poor woman, that must be just a brutal job to have. Well, when she resigned, it was David Scrace who said to me, uh, let's meet after one of our modeling meetings. And he says, would you be willing to serve as secretary of health? I was like, David, you know, I've only been here a year. I barely know New Mexico. Do you really want me to do this? So this was a Wednesday. And I said, can I get back to you next week? He said, no, I need an answer this weekend. And so I start calling my colleagues, mentors around the country. I talk to my family. I pray about it. I'm like, what is the answer here? Well, the humans, everyone was agreeing that you really should do this. You know, this is an important time in our country. So I said, okay, I will do this if it works out with the governor. So she interviewed me. And it's one of those interviews where you don't do any talking. You just kind of nod. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. So it was two days later that her staff called me and she, she had offered me the position. I was clear that I'd moved to New Mexico to really serve as a dean of a new college, but I would take a leave of absence for at least six months just to be helpful to the state. So I was taking a 65% pay cut, stepping in to serve in this tumultuous time as Secretary of Health, but it really was a good experience. And one of the pluses, usually New Mexico is like last in the country for so many things. And finally, we had an opportunity with me having a great team. I had 3,000 employees, a budget of 680 million to oversee as Secretary of Health, but we became one of the leaders in the country for once in vaccine rollout, getting shots in arms. So it was finally a positive for us. And the secret sauce for being successful with the vaccine rollout, in addition to other responsibilities, was having this incident command structure, which is really having your stakeholders to the left, the governor, the cabinet secretaries, having a unified command, having the various uh, logistics and planning. We literally probably had three meetings a day. We started at six, and then I'd had check-ins with the governor, but she was largely screaming most of the time, but she'd calm down, but that was like three days a week. And so lots of meetings, but being organized and it, um, really looking at who are you gonna get shots to and being organized and intentional about that. We had to make sure about the messaging. As many of you know, there was a lot of misinformation going on. So having community members representing us and getting the word out about the importance of the vaccine, making sure we had it in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese was very important. And one other thing we did, looking at the social vulnerability index, which this is an older model where there are 15 um, themes or actually 15 variables. It's now 16 because they've broken out that top layer, their income into your housing and your health insurance. And so it's now 16 variables, but you have a score from zero to one. And really what you're looking at is resilience of a community to deal with something like a pandemic. The more vulnerable you are, the higher your score. So we use the social vulnerability index by county for our vaccine distribution. And we, could, we knew that we had more cases in the more vulnerable counties. So we allocated our vaccines accordingly so that we can get shots in arms to the, those who are most at risk. Many of our Native American communities were decimated. 
African Americans make up about two to three percent of New Mexico, but we had a large number of cases among African Americans, Latinx, and Hispanic. So using this was a tool that was helpful to us as a state. So at about month six, the governor's team reminded her that I was only going to be there six months. And so we talked and she wanted me to stay for about a year. And I said, you know, I could do eight months. It, it was unofficially nine, officially eight, because I went through confirmation. Um, but I agreed to be helpful. You know, I reminded her, I moved to New Mexico to serve as a new dean, a fairly new college that had been started in 2016. And as I moved over with my leave of absence to become secretary, a new boss came in. So I had a new executive vice president and I could hear the rumblings of things, decisions being made. And I thought, oh my God, if I don't get back now, I'm gonna have a mess to deal with. So after eight months, I went back and again, it was a very positive interaction with the governor. You know, I still have positive interactions with her. And I really feel fortunate to have had the opportunity to serve as Secretary of Health. And it's really nice now to have come back to my college. And one of the silver linings was because I kept, I had to testify as Secretary, I got to know the legislature. And many of them kept telling me, you need to ask for more money for public health. Isn't that a nice thing to hear? <laughs> I'm like, you got it. So it was that next legislative session that they talked about giving me 20 million, me, my college, and giving New Mexico State University um, down south 10 million for operations and also giving us 50 million for our own building. But this was a special session and the focus was on redrawing the lines for voting. So the Senator said, you know, come back next month and we'll revisit this because we don't want to make a decision right now. As it turns out, we didn't get the 50 million that time for our building, but we got 10 million for operations. And with that 10 million and New Mexico State got five, we had six deliverables, increase our number of faculty by 13 in two years, increase our number of students, so increase enrollment, create a public health education network, improve our community health assessments to inform our statewide health improvement plan. And then there are two projects um, they wanted us to focus on, substance use and looking at a diabetes prevention and management. So one of the things we've been working on, which was gonna feed into increasing our number of students, had been a PhD program. They had been working on this for 10 years. And when I came in the door, I'm like, let's get this done, let's make it happen. So before I moved to the state, we started working on completing development of our PhD in health equity sciences. One of the things we have to acknowledge in New Mexico is we're a small state. Our population is like 2.3 million. So we knew that it would not be wise to not work with New Mexico State University. So we created a cooperative PhD, health equity sciences, which to our knowledge is the first in the country. Um, and so we enrolled our first cohort in the spring of this year and our second in the fall. So we have about nine PhD students. It's small, I know, but we now have our PhD and this will help with increasing our number of students. In addition to, and those are the concentrations, also providing um, just an opportunity for us to move to an accredited school of public health, which requires that you have at least 21 faculty and a date for graduating your first PhD student. So if anyone wants to transfer over, we can expedite that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll walk that back, okay. So this was the org chart of what I inherited. When I mentioned that I had like nine faculty plus three part-time, we had education was a little bit more developed. We really didn't have a true research infrastructure and we didn't have a faculty affairs. We were very fortunate that within one year, we recruited 21 faculty. It was quite busy. I mean, I gained weight, a lot of sodium with all those dinners. And I, I tell you, I don't wanna negotiate with another faculty member for a little while now. I'm like, I'm kind of tired, you know, that back and forth. Can you give me this? Can you give me that? But we're very fortunate that this is what we look like today. We have 41 faculty. We have a strong administrative infrastructure. We have an associate dean, Dr. Andrus, three assistant deans, and our education team is Blossom. We've more than doubled our administrators. So we have 
recruitment specialists, advisors for our students. So as we grow, we can retain them. The trick for me now is to make sure that we are supporting the faculty we've recruited and having the mentoring in place, setting up mentoring teams. And so we are now looking to grow more and we are going in now to ask for recurring dollars. That 10 million is not gonna last forever. Those are one-time dollars. So the ask for me now with this next legislative session is to get at least 6 million in recurring dollars to support the faculty that we've recruited. Now, mind you, many of them are researchers. They're gonna bring in funding, but if they're gonna pay for their part of their salary, then I can recruit others. So it's the business model that's on my mind. And I just wanted to show you a few pictures of the diversity of the staff we have now. Um, we have you know, really great people who come from very diverse backgrounds. And this is just a snapshot of some of the faculty we've recruited. And so we have Danae, our Native American. Um, we have Latinx, Hispanic. And so we are really trying to walk the walk of looking like the communities we serve. And just a bit about my research. So when I was a medical student, I kept noticing that I, minorities with amputations or limb loss, non-traumatic lower extremity amputations. And I said, is this just me noticing this because I'm an African-American woman or is there something here? And so when I went up to Harvard to complete uh, my master's in public health and the journal medicine fellowship, I had access to my mentor's database, National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, which looked at elective cases in a VA system. And it was there that I had a chance to look to see were there differences by race and ethnicity in rates of non-traumatic lower extremity amputation. And in fact, there were. Hispanics and African-Americans were at least 1.3 to 1.5 times more likely than non-Hispanic white veterans to undergo uh, non-traumatic lower extremity amputations. So what was driving this? This led to me looking more into, okay, diabetes, insensate feet, lower extremities, but there's also a circulation issue, peripheral artery disease. And for me as a student, as a physician, I was taught to palpate the pulse. If it's there, great, really not adequate. What you should be looking at, because someone could have calcification of their artery and you can palpate it, but they still have poor circulation. So peripheral artery disease is really atherosclerosis of the abdominal aorta and the arteries of the lower extremities. And having PAD puts you at risk for having an amputation. And so that began my career looking at peripheral artery disease and outcomes. And one of the first things I did with funding from RWJ was to look to see if there was a difference by race and ethnicity um, in the prevalence of PAD. And others obviously have been thinking about this. And so what I found looking at Hispanics, English and Spanish speaking, African-Americans, Blacks and non-Hispanic whites, that African-Americans were much more likely than non-Hispanic whites to have peripheral artery disease. So then that began my journey of targeting these groups that were at risk and looking at walking is one of the best non-invasive treatments we have for PAD, risk factor management, and getting awareness out there that just because you're getting older and you're walking slower doesn't mean that it's because of your age. You may actually have peripheral artery disease. And so you should be screened, you should be discussed with your physician, and I did some work looking at with my first R01, motivational interviewing versus a scripted counseling approach to get African-Americans with PAD walking. This was a study that I can started in Minneapolis, moved it down to Wichita and increased enrollment to Kansas City. More work needs to be done because motivational interviewing is really good for certain groups. But when you talk to older African-Americans, they're like, I don't need you to roll with me or give me this touchy feely, tell me what to do. So they are more inclined to listen if it was more scripted. But this was a nice study for us to conduct. And then we begin to look at Latino adults and those at risk for PAD and whether or not text messaging could get them engaged. And actually text messaging worked in this uh, study of 69 participants. So that got me energized around technology and looking at a smartphone application to target not only walking, but diet. And so we looked at weight loss and walking, promoting that through a smartphone app. And we actually had some good findings. Interestingly enough, in this cohort, MI was even better than the app 
in getting folks to lose weight and to walk for exercise so that their walking distance would be further. So basically with PAD, you're training the muscles to handle the breakdown products of ischemia by walking more. So you get them to walk at least three days a week for 50 minutes, and then they stop and rest you know, during that 50 minute session, but over time they can walk farther. So when you're thinking about moving from like, I went from clinical to my fellowship, to leadership, research, when you're thinking about opportunities as they come your way, think about what gets you out of bed every day. What gets you excited? And for me, it's making a difference. So Tracy, why does being a dean of a college get you excited? Because I can impact the future workforce of public health. I can get people thinking about medicine and public health. I can get people thinking about the upstream factors. And I can get people to realize that equity, health equity matters. And so when you're thinking about your job opportunities and what you want to do with your career, Think about what's going to help you make a difference and what's going to get you excited. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Dean Collins, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. The motto in our school of public health is be somebody, make a difference. And you've certainly done that. So I don't know how I'm going to follow you. But, uh, but thank you for the opportunity. Good afternoon to everyone here. Um, thank you, Dean Leviste, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I so enjoyed getting to know Dean Leviste when we were together in Cuba in February on an ASPPH sponsored visit. His passion and commitment to the public's health is clearly evident in his actions and words. And it was a special treat to partake of his love of and knowledge about jazz. And clearly he's in the right city for that. So in my talk today, I'll highlight a bit of my leadership journey, but we'll focus mostly on themes of leadership for the future public health leader. I'll conclude with a few suggestions for how the academy can contribute to growing the future public health leadership. I began my career in public health in 1988, serving a two-year fellowship in international health at the Aga Khan University in Karachi, Pakistan, where I had the great privilege of working with Dr. John Bryant, who became my lifelong mentor and a giant in what we then called international health. Of all the attributes that I could speak about today for leadership, it's humility that I believe is a necessary core element and one for which I was given a life lesson in Pakistan. I was leading a small group of um, uh, of researchers from the Aga Khan University to work with traditional birth attendants, Dai, in the rural uh, desert Sindh province outside of Karachi. These traditional birth attendants had no formal training or education and were not able to read or write in their native language. So in developing an algorithm for risk stratification at birth, we developed a pictorial guide. So if the mother's condition looks like this, you go down pathway A. If it looks like this, you go down pathway B, and so on. And at each branching of the algorithm, uh, die, put a check mark uh, for the pathway you select. Simple and straightforward, right? But check mark? Check mark? You see, because these die had not uh, could not read or write in their native language, most had never held a pencil, and there was no meaning or relevance to check mark. So we spent the afternoon passing around a pad of paper while the die practiced making check marks. I've kept that paper now uh, for almost 35 years on my desk, and you can see how I titled it. I hope I have kept that lesson at my leadership core because without true authentic humility, we are blind to how we perceive every other leadership attribute expected of us as leaders. From Pakistan, I served 16 years with the Tennessee Department of Health, most of that time as regional director and health officer for a region of 15 county health departments, mostly in rural Appalachia. 
This is where I really learned public health from people like family planning nurse practitioners who, as one of them said to me, quote, I've been doing this all your life, end quote. In the midst of returning to the academy to get a DRPH, I transitioned from practice to academia, eventually establishing a Department of Public Health at the University of Tennessee, hence the term pracademic, the melding of practitioner and academician, which is exactly what Dr. Collins was talking about in her role as both academician and state secretary. My focus has remained on evidence-based public health, especially the application and implementation of that evidence base in local and state governmental public health agencies. I've continued that focus as Dean of the School of Public Health at UAB, where I've been since 2018. In that context of the application of knowledge and evidence, Two years ago, I joined my friend and colleague from my DRPH days at UNC, Dr. Susan Helm Murtaugh, who's an assistant professor there and teaches the leadership course now in that DRPH program, to write and edit a book on leadership. Let me be the first to acknowledge that I do not consider myself a leadership scholar. I've never done any empirical studies on leadership. I have only tried to observe and learn to be the best leader I can be in the place where I find myself. The book is about leadership and practice. And while we do include chapters on theories and models such as servant leadership, transformational leadership, and authentic leadership, most of the book is about leadership and practice by people who are applying those theories and models in real life situations. In a paper that Susan and I have prepared for the American Journal of Public Health, AJPH, as a follow-on to the book, we identify seven themes that we believe are critical for the public health leader of the future, and I'd like to briefly expand on each of these. Communicate, build, and maintain trust and accountability. The Commonwealth Fund notes that, quote, the public health enterprise is facing a crisis in trust, stemming from experiences with racism and discrimination, ideological opposition, and misinformation, end quote. Leading effectively in the current public health environment requires crisis leadership skills, beginning with the ability to communicate effectively, clearly, and authentically with key stakeholders. Jay Bennett Waters, formerly of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, drawing from his experiences in biodefense and emergency management, prescribes the following elements for successful crisis communication. Anticipation, re applying proactive thought to anticipate and plan for high probability and high consequence events. Stakeholder and perspectives identification understanding who your stakeholders are, what their perspectives are, and filling information gaps with honest, clear, and authentic communication. Clarification, effectively gathering, validating, synthesizing, and communicating timely and reliable information. Simplification, finding the right recipe of simplifying without restricting information. Repetition, communicating with stakeholders early and often, and authenticity, honest, authentic information that enables stakeholders to form their own fact-based conclusions. Second, forge, facilitate, and promote partnerships. While the mission of public health, as defined in the 1988 report on the future of public health, is often quoted, quote, fulfilling the fulfillment of society's interest in assuring the conditions in which people can be healthy, end quote, we less often read what follows this, described as the substance of public health, organized community efforts aimed at the prevention of disease and promotion of health. Such community efforts are impossible without partnerships. The COVID pandemic taught and reminded us that building and maintaining partnerships are critical to public health practice, especially during a crisis. 
Many local and state health departments needed partners to assist with um, the overwhelming work of case investigation and contact tracing. Testing for COVID, housing and caring for the homeless required an extensive array of partners and successful vaccine delivery and that relied on a network of partnerships. The Louisiana Community Public Health, uh, the Louisiana Community Academic Public Health Practice Partnership, or CAP, funded as one of the NIH's Community Engagement Alliance or SEAL programs, is a great example of a partnership that has addressed COVID-19 associated black-white disparities in vaccination. Dean Leviste and Associate Dean Krausel Wood were both contributing authors to this work that will be published in AJPH. Number three, connect public health and healthcare systems. The effects over many decades to more strongly connect public health and healthcare systems is too numerous, are too numerous to count. In the current context, it isn't about filling a gap and meeting the personal healthcare needs of the uninsured or underinsured or Medicaid clients. Rather, it's about connecting the individualized level care, which is the focus of healthcare systems, to the population-focused systems to which the individual belongs, which is the domain of public health. As an example of this during COVID, it, uh, uh, let me talk about our own experiences at the School of Public Health at UAB, where two of our epidemiology faculty were embedded in the university hospital system, developing and managing hospital-based information systems that were used not only to monitor daily census, but also to track the pandemic and to inform decision-making on resource allocation. County and state health officials, it did indeed become the chief health strategist, leading the efforts to match resource availability in health care, such as ICU beds, ventilators, and personnel with highest community needs. This may prove to be one of the most beneficial, and it is hoped for, long lasting impacts of COVID, the forced connectedness between public health and healthcare system, because simply there was no other path to getting to the other side of the pandemic. Build information systems that provide accessible, actionable data. The experiences with COVID-19 related data acquisition at the individual, institutional, and systems levels have brought to light the many inadequacies of data systems in public health and healthcare. Much time was lost in having to build and maintain ad hoc data systems, either because the necessary pieces did not exist or they were incompatible with other pieces of the system. Some of the integration issues are political, others institutional, and others technical. As one of the epidemiologists embedded in the hospital system, Dr. Jerry McGuinn described, too much electronic duct tape and bailing wire had to be used throughout the pandemic. He went on to say that actually getting data systems to talk to each other under the hood, plus having a user-friendly interface so people with no college degree can figure out how to interact with the system is the real novelty. The least significant hurdle is the technical one. The true widget is overcoming the fixed mindsets needing to get it into use. Number five, engage in systems and strategic thinking and action. The public health system includes not only public health agencies at all levels, but clinical care delivery systems, community-based organizations, private nonprofit associations, academia, private industry, and the media. Public health leaders are tasked with not only understanding the attributes and characteristics of each element, but they must also be able to comprehend the relationships between them, the forces that influence their behavior, and how they and the macro level system are likely to adapt in response to those factors. Number six, center equity and inclusivity and understand structural racism as a fundamental driver and creator of health inequities. Quote, we are not in this altogether, end quote. 
As Dr. Lisa Boleg wrote in July of 2020, COVID revealed again the structural inequities that result in disproportionate impact and risk to certain intersections of racial and ethnic status and class, as well as occupation. As long as these inequities persist, she argues, there is no collective we and all. How can there be when our health experiences and outcomes differ so greatly based on our intersectionality? Public health leaders must concern themselves with the health of all, not just for, for, not just for those for whom the system works. It is our individual and collective responsibility to recognize and address the specific needs of marginalized groups. And finally, seven, achieve and maintain resilience and self-care. Resiliency refers to the ability to adapt or recover from change. It is sometimes described as emotional toughness. I can think of no better way to express the importance of self-care and resiliency than to quote our colleague, ASPPH president and CEO, Dr. Laura Magana, who said, Leaders need to take proactive self-protective steps to strengthen and build resilience and reserves. Recharging is an important strategy for resiliency. It is in fact, what allows us to prepare to be resilient. If we recharge our cell phones and computers every day because they lose energy, why don't we recharge ourselves daily? So out of uh, respect of time, let me stop here. I do have some additional thoughts for how the Academy can contribute to this new generation, especially since we've got a number of students in, um, in the auditorium. Um, so um, perhaps we can get to some of these in our conversation to follow. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts and perspectives with you today. Thank you for those remarks. and and. Paul, I want to thank you for letting letting me know that our paper has been accepted. I don't think that we received a, an email or a letter about that just yet. So, Doc, Dr. Krausel Wood got her email this morning because uh, it okay. came from me. Okay, okay. Well, I don't think she's here. No, I don't see her. So I didn't get a chance to know that. So it's good to know that you, we've been accepted. Um, we're we're low on time, so I'll just ask a, a few questions and then we'll open it up for discussion. Um, but. My, my first question is, do you have, and I'll start with, with you, Tracy, do you have a, a leadership philosophy? I mean, you know, some people actually have some sort of a philosophy that they try to lead by. Do you, I haven't heard you talk about that. Do you have one? Have you thought that far into this? Oh, yeah. I mean, my style is more of role modeling. And mm -hmm. if I'm asking someone to provide like a deliverable that I demonstrate that I can also do that. So I am, I, my leadership styles typically are coaching, mentoring, um, being more of a role model. I can be very directive when there's a fire to put out, but it's really leading by example would be the philosophy. Mm -hmm. And Paul, you? It, it, um, one, is, one is anticipation and being prepared. And, and, and so I, I have my notes for when I prepared for my interview to be Dean, anticipating that I would be asked, what is your leadership style? Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. so anticipatory leadership is, is one thing, but uh, there are elements of servant leadership, transformational leadership in, in, in what I do and how I approach my work, but motivational um, mm -hmm. is, is key. My job is to help others be successful mm -hmm. and how to motivate and identify opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, be a servant. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I, I find in, in leadership is that it's important that the people you lead believe that you genuinely care about them. And that's best, and that best occurs if you actually do care about the people you lead. And I think people are willing to work hard if they actually believe that you give a darn about their their. Um, and I think what what helps that a lot is transparency, you know, and sort of being open for people to know. That you listed a number of aspects of leadership in your in your comments, um, but know where you may be um, coming up short. So are any of those leadership elements you talked about, things that you struggle with that you think you're maybe not as good at as you like to be? Oh boy, 
Uh, there are so many things that well, I'm not Tracy, as good you're at. Next, so just, uh, that, I'm, I'm working on it. That I would like to be. <laughs> anticipate no, I, that. <laughs> I, I I think one of one of the um, one of the keys to to ad advancing our our own sense of leadership in that regard um, is is being mindful and being uh, aware of what all our faculty and staff are doing. Um, the, the, the previous dean who um, was before me liked to talk about uh, leadership by walking around. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, you got to have people in the building, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but it, it, is, it, it is this sense that so many interactions take place on an ad hoc basis, things that you learn about that would never have come up. Mm -hmm. And to show that, that you're an active listener and can repeat that in other venues I think shows that that authentically you care because you you've heard this person. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I love that response. For me, I'm largely an introvert. I can become an extrovert and turn on when I need to, but it really drains me. So I've had to learn to be more outgoing so that people can begin to see who is Tracy Collins. Can I trust her? So the transparency piece is huge. There's also faculty want shared governance and students do too. They wanna to know what you're up to. So being transparent, having people at the table to help you make decisions is huge. And providing that support for like my associate dean, providing a coach, an executive coach to help her really grow into her role and being supportive of the assistant deans as well by having weekly, bi-weekly interactions with them I check in with the leadership of my students once a month. Um, and so being available, being transparent and embracing shared governance, mm -hmm. these are things I've learned along the way, but they were initially kind of the mm -hmm. sort of challenge for me or challenges. Yeah. Um, so Greta, do we have a microphone for the audience? Okay, we're gonna start taking some questions because see we're getting low on time. I did, uh, so if you, have a, if you have a question, please raise your hand, we'll get the microphone to you. And while we while we get that going, hopefully, um, I'll say, you know, I think of of the of the list that you provided, Paul. Um, the uh, thing that I think my I see a lot of my staff here, and I think that they would say that what I'm particularly bad at is the self care. I think that's probably what I'm worst at, just doing so much, and I'm ex exhausted all the time because I'm trying to do too much. And I think that's something that I really need to get better at. Um, well, you'll be working even more closely with Dr. Magana in your role as um, uh, as director, um, yeah. uh, as the board of directors for well, SPPA. Yeah. So maybe she can inculcate. And I, I think they would probably say that's a perfect example of you taking on too much and not knowing <laughs> when to scale back. Um, any questions from the audience? Thank you for being here. I'm Kelly, I'm a PhD student here. And I was wondering along, uh, you almost asked my question of um, how do you guys practice self-care when you're in such a demanding role, when you're, service, you're serving other people all of the time? So okay. my approach to self-care is to make sure that I'm working out. So I, I block off time on my calendar for my workouts four days a week. I can't do Orange Theory five, six, because I would end up with an injury. But making sure that I set aside time to exercise, to meditate in the morning, um, and to spend time with my family. The dog wants his time with the ball, and then Rob. And so setting aside time for family is important. And that's that's really my self-care there, those things. I, I can just e echo that. Um, I, 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 I build in time. I don't like to be rushed. So my morning starts at 4.30, but it starts because that's, I go to bed early uh, to make sure I get enough sleep, but being able to, to read early in the morning before any of the day starts, uh, being able to exercise in the morning before I go to work, because once I'm at work, forget about getting exercise during the day or even at the end of the day. So it, it's, it's all about... Um, formatting the day, formatting that that schedule and getting into a habit so that um, it's it becomes second nature. Yeah. 
Well, my answer would be, you know, one of the reasons to have this leadership uh, series is to pick the brains of other leaders so I can learn how to be better at self-care. For, you know, for me, it's, and living in New Orleans has been great for this because music is the thing that I I, I spend a lot of time with, uh, being a musician and, you know, and participating in a lot of the music community here. But that then keeps you up at night, which means you can't get up early in the morning to right. exercise. So I right. try to exercise in the afternoon, which is hard. Yeah. So I'm trying to get better at it. And I acknowledge this is something that I'm just not good at yet. And yeah. I need to I need to improve at it. I saw a hand over here. I have a question for the three of you. Um, all of you have done research, great research for a number of years. And that's probably what motivated you to go into academia. I don't know. But uh, how do you, when you're a dean, do you miss research? Do you carve time to do research? What What are the trade-offs? And are you able to maintain your research? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Dr. Castro. I so enjoyed uh, having coffee with you this morning to talk about our, our mutual interest and concerns about Cuba. Um, so I've I've tried to to maintain uh, my hand in in research um, uh, at at least some involvement, um, uh, working particularly with with other colleagues who are leading the research and allow me to to join their work. Um, my main research partners, Ross Brownson at, at WashU. We do a lot of work together on the academic health department on evidence based public health. Um, and, and, and so it, it, it also, I think that is meaningful for faculty and staff to see if, if I'm going to, to talk repeatedly about the importance of us being a research one university, um, I think modeling that to the degree that I can, I'm not going to write an R01. I know that, um, but I am a co-investigator on an R01. So that's what I try to do. Yeah, and similarly, I, I have gone from like submitting a grant every cycle and being a reviewer for a study section for the NIH to maybe submitting a grant once every two years as the wow. PI, but largely working with others and supporting the faculty assistant professors with their grant submissions. And so it's really a scaled back version that I still do some research for sure. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I just was um, curious because uh, Dr. Irwin and Dr. Collins come from very different states. And so if you could talk a little bit about the leadership challenges, given the political context in which you are currently living in. Yeah, for me, the challenges have been I leaving a red state, Kansas, to move to a blue state, New Mexico. Um, some of the challenges is that there is a lot more assertiveness by many people and a lot of folks want to weigh in on your decisions as a leader because it's more that you know the shared governance extends to community partners so i have had to learn how to set up some boundaries but navigate in a very friendly way but i've never seen so much sort of eyes on everything you're doing as i have in new mexico because like community members pastors Everyone wants to tell the dean of this College of Population Health mm -hmm. as we transition to become a school of public health what she needs to do. And so it's mm -hmm. like, okay, I appreciate your input. I will take that into consideration. That's a tough question. But thank <laughs> you for it. Um, in, in, in Birmingham, we're, um, we're, a, we're a, a blue island in a very, very red state uh, with a state legislature that has passed laws that um, that that Im directly impact the kinds of things that are important to the public health discipline, and so we have to be very um, aware and uh, mindful of what it is we say and how we say it, um, while uh, trying to focus and keep the focus on what it is that UAB values, what are our core values. And, um, and and that's that's been the way that we've tried to to walk that very fine line, but it continues to be a challenge. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah. 
Hello, my name is Allison Hirsch. I'm a PhD student in the biomedical sciences program. So I'm part of the School of Medicine. And I just have a question for you guys. Um, so I know in biomedical sciences, we do the basic research side of things and you're more of the translational uh, applications of those sciences. And so I feel like we're kind of circling the same drain in terms of things that are important to us and what we care about. And so my question to you all is, how do you think that we can better bridge basic sciences and also public health to create a more streamlined um, kind of application of the sciences that, that my field is looking at? Well, it's a great question. And I think uh, bridging that does go back to one of your points there about communication and figuring out opportunities for connecting and networking. So helping the basic scientists and the public health researcher leader come together, come to the table with their ideas, having forums where you have people present their work and then figuring out if there's opportunity for you to partner with them. Um, and then being led, you know, like your dean, your chair, is that person advocating for cross unit collaborations? You know, if you have a diverse team, like diversity in many other areas, it's only gonna get stronger. Yeah. I'm sure Senior Associate Dean Arkari can uh, can identify with this. For us, it's about interprofessional education. That's part of what we're required by our accrediting body to do. Um, and, it, and it's about not just um, checking the box to say we did it, uh, but, but the true integration of the education of those who are in biomedical sciences to those who focus um, on the community with their stethoscope rather than the individual. So that 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 integration, I, I think, is a is a huge, hugely important opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a critical question you're asking because the the really important problems are all too complex for any one discipline to to address, right? And but we we compartmentalize knowledge into disciplines, right? You know, this is botany and this is biology and this is chemistry, but the world doesn't can can point to that, right? And that's the huge problem that we have. We're we're working on developing programs, training programs that cut across schools. You know, we we're having we're not ready to announce that yet, but we're we're developing a program right now that will be a um, a graduate level program that will be a joint program between multiple schools and to deal with climate change to address people who are trained to address that problem. Um, but I think it's going to require that you know, the kind of the creativity of doing things like that, um, <clears throat> which then potentially leads to other challenges like, well, where do these people work? So with a PhD, like you have the PhD program in health equity. Okay, well, where's the Department of Health Equity at what university that will hire that? You know, that's the kind of challenge that you face when you when you go with these interdisciplinary programs. So while it's what the world needs, we in academia are not really well set up and well suited to, to 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 you know kind of receive these people to do that kind of work and i think as leaders that's where we need to be also yeah, thinking about point. Yeah. you know um i think d had a question and then i'll try to squeeze one more in but we are already over time so i know that that could be a challenge so um my question is uh schools and programs of public health have proliferated over the past you know 20 years um have we reached a saturation point? And if so, what does the future look like for academic public health when, you know, there are still more and more like in the pipeline? Yeah. Well, I'll take a stab at that. Um, you know, when, when UAB uh, became a school of public health in 1979, we were the 20th. Uh, now they're 64, 65. And, uh, more accredited programs than I can count. The curious thing that I find, though, is that the percent of state and local governmental public health employees who have formal academic training mm -hmm. has hardly budged in yeah. the last 20 years. Yes. So um, I, I, I think we have a workforce issue mm -hmm. um, that is really challenging for academia to connect with. Only a minority of our graduates go into governmental public health practice. So there, while there may be saturation in other areas, there is not saturation in terms of the connection between academia and public health practice. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's important to look at data. Where are your graduates going? What are the jobs that they're actually um, getting based on their degree? We are not, you know, near saturation at this point. We still need so many workers, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, both in the academic sectors and also in, you know, state government. So we have been an accredited MPH program predating the formation of the College of Population Health. We were accredited as a program for more than 20 years. And we are now moving to become an accredited school of public health so that we can increase the workforce for New Mexico, for the Southwest, so the region, and for the country. And so there's still so much more that we need to do. Mm -hmm. I think with that, the big challenge is gonna be that the pool of potential trainees is shrinking. Right at the same time that the number of programs is expanding. So, you know, schools like ours, that's really set up as, with an infrastructure to accommodate a large number of students. We're gonna have to take a real look at what does that mean and how do we continue to, you know, sort of build out this, this workforce when people are not going into public health. Yes. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? I'd love to end with a student, but I think most of the students have left because they have classes at one o'clock. <laughs> so, um, well, uh, let's end it here. It, it's been a, a pleasure to have you you both here, um, but I have a few things, a few things I need to do from, from a housekeeping standpoint or the staff will definitely come get me. Uh, okay. So a big thank you to everyone for joining us both online and in the in, in the auditorium. And a big thank you to our guests, uh, Dean uh, Tracy Collins and Dean Paul Irwin. But before you leave, a couple of quick announcements. We hope you'll mark your cal calendars for the next Dean's Leaders in Lanyap lecture on Wednesday, November 8th. We'll be joined by Dean Nancy Messenger from the University of North Carolina Gilling School of Pu Global Public Health and Dean Donna Peterson from the University of South Florida College of Public Health. I also highly encourage those of you that are here to stick around a bit for the lanyap in the Duval Gallery. We have a wonderful art exhibit, The Art of Birthing, that is worth seeing, and some of the curators are here with us today. Thank you all, and hope to see you back here in November. Thank you.